looks like I think most people are out of the waiting room. Um, so we will uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, my name is uh, Vic Weaver. Um, I am uh, filling in for Tommy today, who's uh, in an airport on his way back from CPDD. He's uh, in Pearson, so he's he's here um, and able to sort of contribute. Um, but we've got a super super exciting session planned today on uh, multidisciplinary care teams for the um, care of infective endocarditis. Um, we've got four really great speakers. Um, I'll introduce them all. We'll go through some talks. Um, we are hoping, because we have a, a lot to get through, that if folks could just sort of hold their questions to the end or, or put them in the chat box and we'll sort of work to moderate them and um, get through them. Um, so to introduce our lovely speakers, um, Robin Lennox is a family physician and assistant professor with the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University. She's the co-head of service for the inpatient addiction medicine at Hamilton Health Sciences and St. Joseph's Hospital and is the lead investigator for the Second Heart Program. Um, Simeon Kimmel is an assistant professor of medicine at Boston University School of Medicine and an attending physician in the sections of general internal medicine and infectious diseases at Boston Medical Center and the medical director of Project Trust, which is Boston Medical Center's harm reduction focused drop-in center. He trained in internal medicine and primary care at Brigham and Women's Hospital and then completed a joint fellowship in addiction medicine and infectious diseases at Boston Medical Center. He earned a master's degree in medical anthropology from the Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and in 2021 received a career development award from the National Institute of Drug Abuse to improve medication for opioid use disorder retention following serious injection related infections. Uh, broadly, he is focused on the integration of addiction treatment and harm reduction services for those at risk for infectious and medical complications of substance use. Um, Dr. Eric uh, Autry uh, trained in internal medicine at the University Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, and subsequently trained in cardiovascular disease at Boston Medical Center and joined the faculty at that institution thereafter. Uh, he serves as the director, or has served, sorry, as the director of education, inpatient medical director, CCU director, outpatient medical director, and is currently associate chief for clinical affairs as the section of cardiology. He's an invasive non-interventional cardiologist with a clinical interest in uh, valvular heart disease and has been involved with our endocarditis working group since its inception. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, Melissa Weimer uh, is a, Dr. Melissa Weimer is a clinician educator who is board certified in internal medicine and addiction medicine. Uh, she's an associate professor of medicine and public health at the Yale School of Medicine and the medical director of the Yale Addiction Medicine Consult Service. Dr. Weimer has a clinical and research focus on expanding access to treatment for patients with substance use disorders, particularly in the hospital setting. She is also passionate about expanding the workforce of healthcare professionals who can treat patients with substance use disorders. Um, so incredibly exciting, what a group. Um, we will uh, start with uh, Dr. Lennox uh, for a bit of the Canadian perspective and, and carry on from there. So I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you. I'll just take one second to get my slides up. Um, and I know there's a, a lot of wonderful speakers today, so I will try to move things fairly quickly, and then we're happy to take questions at the end, and I'm happy to add any, any details at the end as well. Um, but I'm primarily going to be speaking about uh, the program that we have started here in Hamilton, uh, Ontario, which is called the Second Heart Program. Um, and it's currently in its pilot study phase, but it is an endocarditis team specifically for people who inject drugs um, after infective endocarditis. Um, and again, it's uh, the way we sort of structured things, it was really inspired by um, a few patients, particularly three young women uh, who unfortunately uh, all died within a year of their diagnosis of infective endocarditis a few years ago. Um, and really what we learned from, from managing them is that um, while we had a number of different um, team members involved, we didn't probably have the right team members for them and the ones that really were needed to meet their particular needs. Um, so we wanted to put together a multidisciplinary team that was not just a traditional endocarditis team, but actually included people specifically that would serve the needs of this community. Um, and we recognized that we not only needed a multidisciplinary team in hospital, but we needed a team that would move from hospital to the community. And we decided to try this for the first entire year post-infection to see if we'd be able to make a difference in outcomes. 
Um, and I'll just start um, with a case and I just introduced the program. This was actually our first participant in the program, SHO1. Um, and so he uh, came to us in January 2021. Uh, he's a 28 year old man who had presented to hospital with severe sepsis. He basically went right into ICU, required intubation and pressors. He was diagnosed with a tricuspid endocarditis, had septic emboli, and significant hypoperfusion of his legs. Um, and uh, at one point, thought there was going to be uh, significant vascular compromise to the legs. Um, at the time, it was estimated that he had about a 50% risk of operative uh, mortality, and this was his first endocarditis episode. Um, now, when we received this phone call from the surgeon about this patient, there were a lot of concerns of, about whether or not to operate, um, both um, because of his significant risk of operative mortality and how compromised he was when he initially presented, um, but then also because of some contextual factors. So. Uh, it was at a time of very strained ICU resources during the second COVID wave. And in this particular hospital, there was uh, a lot of pressure on the ICU team. Um, and there was also very limited background available on this patient. So because he came in so compromised, uh, we weren't able to learn that much from him other than from collateral. We knew that he uh, was currently deprived of housing, was sleeping rough, had a history of injection use of fentanyl and methamphetamine, was not on any treatment at the time and had very little social supports, so was not connected with any family members, did not have any sort of outreach team in the community and was very isolated. Um, and he was our first patient who enrolled in this program. And I think the reason I, I wanted to bring up his case is because I have heard in some of the other talks some um, questions about, um, you know, concerns about use of resources and sometimes a question of, you know, futility or questions about what is someone's prognosis. Um, and those I, were... If I so, could... Oh, there you go. Your slides just weren't advancing. Oh, okay. Are you seeing it now? Yeah, we see SHO1 there. Perfect. January 2021. Perfect. That's great. Yeah. Um, and so the reason I brought up um, his case was because in the beginning, there were questions about um, futility, about what his prognosis might be, particularly given his lack of um, housing, lack of any sort of supports. Um, and that's sort of where we started this whole project. So he did end up enrolling in our program and we connected him with our Second Heart team. Uh, our team consists of six main core members. Um, the two most important are the peer support workers. So that's someone with lived experience of drug use and sometimes lived experience of homelessness um, who can provide a lot of informal support, introduction to harm reduction resources and community resources. A systems navigator who's basically trained in helping someone navigate the health system, but also in accessing things like income and housing supports an addiction medicine physician, both in hospital and uh, in the community, a family physician if someone's not already attached, an infectious disease physician, and a cardiac surgeon. And we have one particular infectious disease physician who's Dr. Tim O'Shea, and one cardiac surgeon, Dr. Rich Whitlock, who are um, part of our team and who we try to get all referrals with uh, upon discharge. And the goal of our program uh, was fourfold. So we wanted to bridge the gap between hospital and home, which we identified as the most high risk time for our patients was sort of the first four weeks after they left hospital. I put an asterisk beside home because for many of our patients, home is not actually a physical place or an address, um, but uh, sometimes is shelter, transitional beds program. Um, sometimes um, folks are living in encampments. Um, but we wanted to find a way uh, to make that transition from hospital to wherever they were going, go more smoothly. We wanted to enhance supports with a focus on unmet needs, particularly around substance use, social supports, and housing. We wanted to assess the feasibility of this team, both in terms of funding sustainability, but also in terms of how the team worked together and whose roles were, um, uh, were important. And then we also ideally wanted to try to reduce adverse outcomes in the first year. So in hospital, the way our team sort of works, so once someone's identified as potentially eligible, because we're still in a research pilot phase, um, the initial contact is from a research coordinator. They do the recruitment and an initial needs assessment, sort of gaining a sense of what this person's goals are. Um, then we introduce them to the peer worker and systems navigator who make their first contact while that individual is still in hospital. They do their own assessment to get a sense of this person's needs, what they need in hospital, and more importantly, what they're gonna need for the year following their discharge. Uh, if it hasn't already been done, they would have inpatient addiction medicine consultation if they would like. Um, as it has happened now, all of the patients that have enrolled have already had that consultation prior to us um, becoming involved as a second heart program, which is great. 
And then the, the kind of core components uh, of collaboration in hospital are a, a multidisciplinary case conference. Um, this happens with um, the MRP, which is usually either medicine or surgery. Um, any sort of consultants involved in hospital, like ID, cardiology, inpatient social work, and then our second heart team, which includes the peer, the systems navigator, and others. And the patient is also invited to attend as well. Um, and the goal of the case conference is really around comprehensive discharge planning. Um, so both discussing what the hospital plan has been, but then how is that plan going to work once that person leaves and trying to identify any barriers. Um, and it's been very helpful in a lot of ways. Sometimes the in-hospital team will comment that they didn't realize, for example, that the person didn't have ID or med coverage or a place to go or a way to get their antibiotics. And so those sort of troubleshooting things are what we aim to do in the case conference. And then the patient is given basically a written discharge plan with a calendar of all their follow-up appointments, um, the contact information for their team, um, and how they're going to work with them over the next year. Uh, after discharge, we do have a schedule that we um, try to stick to in terms of points of contact. Um, so for our peer worker, they're the ones who have the most contact with the participants. So um, in, unless they've heard from the participant, they reach out sort of once a week for the first three months of the program, and then every two weeks for the year afterwards. Um, the participant can also reach out to them and they can meet more frequently, but at minimum, they'll get a weekly check-in. The focus is usually on social support, um, sometimes helping them access harm reduction supplies or education, a lot of the time assisting with accessing healthcare services, so attending appointments, getting to the pharmacy, um, that sort of thing, um, and then a lot of times just informally connecting, going for a coffee, chatting about how they're doing, that sort of thing. Um, the systems navigator is sort of the second most frequent point of contact, so they connect every two weeks for the first three months and then monthly. Um, and their roles really focused on income and housing would be the two things that I'd say they work on the most, um, but they can also help with other sort of systems wide uh, issues as well. Um, for family physicians, again, if they don't have one already, we'll try to attach them to a family physician who sees them within two weeks of hospital and then sort of as per usual care. Infectious disease follow-up is usually per whatever um, care instructions, but usually by the time they finish their antibiotics, they've seen infectious disease. Our um, designated physician is Dr. O'Shea, who um, most importantly has a drop-in clinic at one of our harm reduction organizations called the AIDS Network. And so he has one afternoon a week, which is fully drop-in. That's where most of our patients reconnect to infectious disease care. But he also has a pre-booked outpatient clinic for those who want um, a different setting. They can also see him at a different clinic. We also provide a cell phone or phone cards to participants for the first year to maintain communication. Um, and then our inner team of the Second Heart team basically meets monthly to run the list of all the patients involved, um, talk about how they're doing, who do we need to reconnect with, and sort of brainstorm as a team how we can meet some needs if there are any unmet needs outstanding. Um, we don't have a lot of outcome data because we're still um, in the phase of our primary study, but we do have some just baseline data about demographics um, to show who we're serving. So um, our participants are sort of fairly evenly split, 46% male, about half and half are first infection versus, versus a recurrent infection, and the most number of infections someone's had in our program is four. Um, about 23% had a surgical intervention at the time of their enrollment in the study, um, and almost 80% are deprived of housing. So the vast majority of our population that we're serving uh, are currently homeless. Um, we know that the study is pretty much acceptable to most people, so we weren't sure how people would feel about having a big team involved in their care and all these different providers, but they actually um, were really eager to. So about 13 out of 14 approached participants decided to enroll. Um, we haven't had any formal dropouts. We've had four lost to follow up and a few people who sort of um, seem lost to follow up and then end up reconnecting um, and one death, which was unfortunately a result of um, severe sepsis um, due to incomplete treatment of her endocarditis. In terms of lessons learned, so things we've learned so far, so we really need to find ways to reconnect with people. So um, particularly because our um, the vast majority of our participants don't have a stable address um, and often don't have stable communication technology, uh, notifications when participants are readmitted to hospital is really important. So those tend to be the biggest opportunities for reconnecting with the team is when someone's presented to hospital. We don't yet have a great way to flag that when someone comes to the emergency department. Usually when they're readmitted to hospital, our inpatient addiction team becomes that sort of connection point back to the second heart team. But that's something that would be very valuable, I think, in other, other sorts of teams and settings. 
as well as having community hubs. So places someone can go in the community where they know they can try to ask to reconnect with their multidisciplinary team. And for us, this has ended up being the AIDS network where one of our peers uh, works as well as our infectious disease physician. And people generally know that they can drop in there and get reconnected. Uh, along those same lines, maintaining communication has been a real challenge. And so we initially started giving people physical phones with a like a traditional talk and text plan. That doesn't work so well because the phones tend to get, they get lost, they get stolen for whatever reason they have to be traded or sold. Um, so we've moved away from giving people a physical device because many people actually have a device. They just needed a phone card or support to um, have ongoing minutes. Um, so that's one thing that we sort of switched throughout the study as well as gathering multiple possible contact methods and being really creative around communication. So in addition to phone, which numbers tend to change very frequently, um, trying to get emails, mailing addresses, either for that individual or for someone close to them in their support network, um, collaborating with community agencies, and then asking people, are there physical places where you might go where we could get a message to you? So for example, for one person, we're able to send letters to Ontario Works where they go to get their, um, their check every month. And that's a place where they're able to reconnect with our team if they've lost contact. Um, We've also learned, and this was no surprise, but we've learned that the peer role is the most valued and most important role uh, in this work. Um, so that's the person that has the most connection and that's the person that tends to be the one um, that our participants give feedback as being the most valuable and has been the most impactful. And so I think really empowering peers in, this, in these types of programs is critical. Um, and we've actually had requests for longitudinal support after that year because they form such strong bonds that it's very difficult when that sort of one year point comes to disconnect. Um, so thinking about frameworks for longitudinal support is our next, our next goal as well as the ability to match, match peer expertise with participant experience. So we realized quite early on that if our peers didn't have as much experience, for example, with um, lived experience of homelessness, sometimes they found it more difficult to maintain connections with um, participants who were living in encampments or who had quite mobile lives. And so um, by matching that expertise, we actually found we were able to maintain those connections a lot longer and, and uh, make participants feel a lot more supported. Um, the other lesson that we've learned, and this is just sort of an experience, is that, you know, we were very happy to have this program and proud of this program, but it's one very small piece in terms of what our patients are up against in those first few years after this infection. And the things that we find are really driving the adverse outcomes are larger structural barriers. And in particular for our group, we've noticed homelessness, criminalization, and, and stigma and poverty are sort of the critical ones that are preventing people from thriving. Um, for example, one of our participants was very motivated, got connection, got connected to this team, but then ended up um, going to jail for four months. And that interrupted his treatment. It interrupted his involvement with the team, his goal setting. Um, and that's something that, you know, even if we have the great plan and great team, it's really hard to overcome that. Um, and similarly with anti-stigma initiatives, you know, we have this wonderful medical team that's willing to do outreach. Um, but when people have been concerned about reinfection, recommended going back to hospital, there's still so much to overcome in terms of previous stigmatizing and negative experiences that it's still hard to get people to want to go back to hospital um, despite having the team around them. So just keeping in context that even though we're, we're happy to build these programs, we still really need to continue advocacy on these larger issues um, or else we're only going to get so far. In terms of funding, I thought this might be of interest to others trying to build programs. So we were initially grant funded as a, a research study um, and that also allowed us to support some personnel. So um, we do pay the peer support workers from that research study fund, um, but we're fortunate that we only have to pay for a portion of their salary because they're employed part-time or full-time with other organizations, which has given us a lot of flexibility. Um, we also received in-kind resources for our systems navigator. Our first systems navigator was employed by one of our hospitals and was able to spend some time with us. And our second systems navigator is seconded from a family health team locally. Um, so I think thinking about in-kind resources is a way to make this feasible, um, even if you don't have ongoing funding and also a benefit to have people employed full-time elsewhere um, because of the sporadic nature of this work, it tends not to be able to support a full-time equivalent in our program at least. Um, so having people have a larger portfolio that this can be a part of, um, I think allows it to be a bit more sustainable. 
And returning to our case, so um, after he was initially consulted, um, he had his tricuspid valve replacement. He was started on buprenorphine in hospital and he stabilized really quickly. He didn't have any ongoing substance use before he left. We were able to discharge him to a transitional bed setting where he was able to get uh, completion of his antibiotics in a nurse supported shelter setting, um, which was really helpful for him. Unfortunately, he was readmitted to hospital for a COVID infection in March, but was still actually doing well from a substance use perspective at that time. Things started to take a turn around six months after his infection. He had a severe depressive episode, ongoing severe um, use disorder with um, uh, frequent injection drug use of fentanyl. Um, but he did continue on his treatment, his Cadian. Um, he was unfortunately readmitted at that time for a prosthetic uh, valve endocarditis. He completed medical therapy at that point. Um, and there were sort of questions arising again about ongoing stay in the transitional beds program, whether or not this was actually therapeutic for him. And unfortunately, subsequent to that, he ended up uh, becoming homeless again, was sleeping rough in encampments um, and ended up readmitted for a third uh, endocarditis infection in September. Um, and I, I bring this all up because I think there were a lot of points during this time where people were asking about what is his prognosis, what should we do in terms of ongoing treatment for him, um, what's the right use of resources, all of those questions arose. Um, but quite happily, by the time he reached the one year mark, um, he completed his antibiotics for that third endocarditis infection, he's now on chronic suppressive therapy. Um, he had reconnected with his family who actually, um, because he had stabilized, allowed him to move back into their home. Um, he had finally had stable housing for the first time in many years. He was able to get on disability support program, got some more income. And his goal was complete abstinence. And by the time I spoke to him in January, he'd had 113 days substance free and was incredibly proud, stable on his Cadian, um, in regular contact with his peer worker and his physician. Um, and was just very happy and optimistic and grateful for all of the care that he had received. And I think he's the story that I now think of when we have patients or, or not patients, healthcare providers ask about prognosis and um, futility, because if someone had asked us to uh, to give a prognosis, there's just no way we could have ever predicted what had happened. And um, I think his capacity um, to adapt and change and work on this and get through all these things um, far exceeded anything that probably anyone would, uh, would have imagined. And, um, and I think because of that, he's the one I go to when I say, you know, we need to offer everything to everyone because we have no way of predicting how things are going to go, but there's huge potential for people to have um, very, very healthy, wonderful outcomes. And he's um, happily a case of that. Um, so that's the end of my uh, section. I'm happy again to take questions at the end. Um, and thank you everyone. I'll stop sharing at this point. Oh, that was a, an amazing overview of, uh, of that program. And there's um, definitely some questions and comments in the chat that we can come back to um, at the end and chat a little further about. Um, I didn't know who, who was going next from our group. Dr. Kimmel, did you want to go? Sure, we can certainly go. And um, yeah, that's a big little, uh, we can uh, here. Um, try to be quick to make sure there's time for Dr. Weimer also. Um, so uh, that that presentation really highlights, um, uh, you know, some of the incredible complex challenges that that uh, that patients have, um, and so we're going to kind of uh, describe some of the some of the gaps in care we saw at BMC and um, and the formation of the multi multidisciplinary endocarditis group uh, at our hospital. Um, we don't have any financial disclosures. Um, so we'll talk about the uh, sort of overview of endocarditis and addiction care at BMC, some of the gaps, the working group, and then some of the, the successes and challenges. And one thing we just wanted to highlight, um, so this is uh, most of the endocarditis cases uh, at BMC uh, are related to injection drug use. So I think um, right, there's high rates of homelessness among people who have injection drug related endocarditis. Uh, and you know, in the other hospitals in our, around, uh, around BMC, uh, you know, the population who has endocarditis is, is, is fairly similar, but our hospital, essentially most of the endocarditis is related to drug use. Um, and so as a hospital, we really need to figure out how we were going to address that. Um, and, you know, you can see that the, the, the patients are, uh, are quite young, um, uh, that most of the endocarditis is native valve, uh, a little bit of prosthetic valve. Um, 
there's uh, about 10, a little less than 10% have root or annular abscesses. Um, and this, this year, um, about 15% underwent uh, surgical therapy. And this, this data is kind of the, the last two years or so after the endocarditis working group. Um, and, uh, you know, access to surgery was one of the, um, one of the big challenges. So we, of, of the cohort of people with endocarditis here, um, it was kind of a mixture of right and left sided, uh, left side disease, about 50%, a little less than 50% had right side disease, um, but quite a few with multivalvular disease. Uh, and this is in the context of having um, quite robust, uh, at least for US standards, um, quite robust addiction services. Uh, so um, I think that the, the, the key service uh, is an addiction consult service, uh, which sees patients with, uh, with substance use disorders, initiates methadone, buprenorphine. Um, unfortunately, we're not allowed to uh, offer KD to patients uh, in the United States. Um, but this is part of a kind of continuum of care. There's a street level drop-in center with outreach staff. There's a low barrier buprenorphine clinic that also initiates methadone and links people to methadone uh, to an opiate treatment program. There's uh, addiction treatment in, in, um, in primary care. There's a program specifically for youth and specifically for families and pregnant women um, and for people with psychiatric uh, diseases as well. So there's, there's kind of a robust addiction services um, there's a lot of endocarditis, but uh, there was not very good access to valve replacement surgery. Um, you know, the kind of care in the hospital, uh, it seemed like there wasn't clear, consistent, timely decision-making and the communication across clinical services wasn't very, very good. Uh, there wasn't necessarily shared understanding about the disease processes, prognoses, people's rights and resp responsibilities we have to care for people. And really kind of, uh, it wouldn't be so uncommon to see in a, in a, in a note, right, that someone's, you know, not drug use, not a surgical candidate, as opposed to kind of weighing the risks and benefits around surgery based on the risk and the, um, uh, the type of endocarditis uh, and, and what was going on. And then another gap is, as um, was highlighted in the last presentation is, you know, supportive environments for people following these inpatient hospitalizations. So um, of just under 300 cases of injection related endocarditis at BMC, our surgical rates uh, prior to the formation of our of the endocarditis working group, which really kind of took off uh, around 2018, um, were, were extremely low. So uh, the you know the rates of, of, of surgery were were probably uh, too low for uh, who actually uh, needed surgery. That was one um, one issue. Um, patients experienced stigma. This is from a study done uh, interviewing patients who were uh, who had who were using drugs, not specifically with endocarditis, but um, it, it sort of highlights uh, the minute they find out you're an injection drug user, the doctors, you can see it right in their face. They change their whole attitude. They don't want to help you. It's weird. It, I don't like the treatment. I hate telling doctor, the doctor that I use drugs. I hate it. Their whole attitude changes. And at the same time, surgeons who were taking care of patients with endocarditis also felt like they lacked support. So this was uh, a set of qualitative interviews that we did with surgeons at BMC and other hospitals in the United States. Um, and the surgeon said, you know, people who are not surgeons, they don't truly understand what it is to do these operations, to get them through. Do we feel supported caring for these patients? 100% no. Um, and, and so there was this kind of mixture of lots of endocarditis related to drug use, patients not happy, surgeons not happy, um, inability to access post-acute care for people. This is a study that I led looking at um, referrals to post-acute care. Uh, and skilled nursing facilities are violating the Americans with Disabilities Act quite frequently, rejecting people um, uh, from post-acute care. Uh, and that leads to, this is the study looking at, from national data, looking at lengths of hospitalizations. There's much longer hospitalizations for people with opioid use disorder related infections um, compared to people without opioid use disorder. So um, lots of challenges uh, and you know, we started really kind of trying to focus on, on inpatients, like improving the inpatient processes of care, making sure people got the care that they needed. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Autry um, to kind of lead us through the formation of this group and, and some of the issues. I think you're, you're, you're muted still here. There we go, technically challenged here. Um, thanks, Em. Uh, I'll try to go through the rest of this relatively quickly and allow time for discussions. I think the questions to be asked are probably maybe more important than the data we'll cover. Um, but I think it's important to note that this idea of, of endocarditis treatment teams or 
consultation teams or whatever their, their titles in the institution, has really been around for, for quite a while. Uh, this is a, a study done back in 2009, which looked at uh, the effect of instituting a, a what they called a, a multidisciplinary team or a therapeutic protocol, which included not only a, just the members of the endocarditis team, but standardizing uh, conservative management of antibiotics and standardizing surgical indications. It showed that once you institute this type of a protocol, you really significantly impact the patient's care. Uh, it leads to shortened courses of antibiotics, uh, more appropriate antibiotics, completion of antibiotics, less complications, and importantly, uh, probably has an impact, uh, a favorable impact on mortality in these patients. And as we know, they're all challenging patients and it's, it's hard to really have a significant impact, but I think these teams have been shown to do so. Um, there's been other studies, uh, there's one out of France published in 2019 that looked at similar uh, outcomes and, and showed favorable outcomes in these patients. But importantly, if you look at both these studies as well as others, uh, there's a minority of patients who have uh, drug use associated endocarditis. I think it was 9% in this study and in uh, eight or 9% in, in the French study. Uh, but based on this data, the, the uh, various organizations have uh, come up with guidance that these teams are so important that they really are, are class one indications. They, are, they, they should be incorporated into the care of these patients. This is a guideline from 2016 from the thoracic societies, really suggesting that patients should be managed by a multidisciplinary team and patients should be seen in a hospital where such a team exists. So I think it's really evolving into a lot of what other uh, aspects of cardiac care have been, which is get the patient to the institution that can support the patient and make sure everybody who needs to be there is there. So in the next slide, thanks Tim. Um, in 2017, myself and one of the, the surgeons, uh, Nick Dabrilovic, were in the SICU taking care of a patient and realized that it'd been a long time since they'd operated on a patient with endocarditis. Uh, and we, we started to think about what we could do to try to uh, improve the care of these patients, not just from getting them through surgery, but identifying what is the, really the best management of the patients. I think we were in an era of, a high level of risk aversion. Uh, there'd been uh, challenges with these patients in the past. We had shared the care of these patients with uh, other institutions in our city. And, and I think there was a general consensus that um, management was becoming so difficult for these complex patients that nobody really wanted to operate on a first time, let alone a second or third time. Um, and because of the nature of the patients we see, uh, we have a huge burden of uh, IBDU associated uh, endocarditis uh, and they're all these young patients who we felt somewhat helpless with. And so we decided to throw together this group, which consisted of multiple specialties, which you, you, know, you see here. It's always included uh, representatives from cardiology, cardiac surgery, ID, addiction services, uh, and neurology is sort of the core. Uh, and we pulled in social work, case management, uh, pharmacy, uh, and various other medical subspecialties to help not only develop systems of care related to their specialties, but to help discuss patients' specific issues related to pulmonary, um, GI, et cetera. Um, next slide, if you could, Tim. The, the whole goal of the uh, committee was really to try to identify uh, what it is that we were doing wrong, uh, try to see what we could do to impact not only the, the acute hospital care, but what kind of systems we could set up to try to facilitate the patients getting in, into the hospital through their hospital care, identify what the best treatment of the patient is, irrespective of uh, subjective opinions, uh, and to really end up with a consensus agreement among all specialties regarding what the best care was. Uh, as Sim mentioned, we, I think we're stuck in a rut back then in regarding how to make the decision about patients going to surgery or not going to surgery. And often there was uh, differing opinions from differing services. There was mixed messages being spread to patients, patients' family, to caring teams. There was frustration with communication. And because many of the specialty teams would see the patients independent of others, you end up with this disconnect between plans, you know, where one team would come by and say there's absolute indication for surgery, and the other team would come by and say there's absolute contraindication of surgery. Uh, and it led to a lot of, I think, missed opportunities for providing optimal care for these patients. Um, Always, though, as part of this, we've recognized that the, the issue, as everyone knows, is not really the endocarditis. It's, it's the underlying addiction. And if we don't treat that, we really are not treating the issue. 
Many of our patients prior to 2014 or so when we started our addiction services uh, inpatient uh, consult service, uh, many of the patients were being discharged without appropriate care for their addiction. And, and I think they returned to the uh, either homelessness, uh, the environment, the social uh, situation that they came in from, and it just subjected them to a markedly increased risk of recurrence. Uh, and, and so our sense was that if we don't establish systems by which we can help facilitate their addiction care, we won't be able to deal with their relapsing endocarditis. So addiction medicine has always been part of our, uh, our core group of uh, the endocarditis treatment uh, plan and have always been sort of central to risk stratifying these patients. I think we have migrated away from you know, candidacy or not candidate for surgery and much more into a discussion of what, what are the objective measures that, um, that would lean us towards saying the patient needs surgery or measures that suggest the patient does not have need surgery. And then look into those complicating factors which may weigh into the patient's risks and then have really a multidisciplinary discussion amongst all the involved specialties um, so that everybody can sort of weigh in on, on what their particular angle is regarding the patient's care. What is the uh, cardiac indications for surgery? What are the cardiac surgical risks and complications that are anticipated? What is the nature of their addiction and where in their spectrum are they in regards to recovery or in, in plans and goals? Uh, and that everybody could come together, view the data that's important, neurology could review the, the neuro data, and everybody weigh in on really what is the best medical management. And then our goal was really to come up with a, a plan to um, get the patient through whatever the medical or surgical management was, not necessarily to say they're not a candidate because of you know, the, the complicating factors. Um, the successes we've had with this, I think it's led to a marked improvement in communication, not just amongst specialties, but also between the primary team and the services. Now we as a team don't necessarily see the individual patients. The vast majority of the time, some member of our team has been clinically involved with the patient, but there are times where the teams will come to present their patient to us as, as a, in a forum to really come to some decision. And I think the communication that, that occurs there where everybody leaves the meeting realizing we know where we stand, we know what the thought processes are, we understand everybody's concerns, uh, and we have a plan for where to go to next to get to where we need to be with our patient. I, I think it's led to a marked improvement in satisfaction, not only from the physician standpoint, but also the patient standpoint. I think we've come to some standardization of how we view these patients, what are their indications for surgery, uh, and rather than just um, somewhat of a subjective measure of candidate, not candidate, I think we really are beginning to weigh the risks and benefits on an, on a, an individual basis, but also in a reproducible and standardized way. Uh, and then I, th I think we probably do have improved outcomes. It's, it's hard. We haven't looked at our specific data. I, I think as, as we showed before, there's data to suggest at least in the non-drug uh, use associated uh, endocarditis that these teams have significant impact. But I, I think we, we similarly have a significant impact. If, if you look at just patients getting to and through surgery, uh, we've been much more successful in the last couple of years. As Sim mentioned, we had an exceedingly low rate of of operating on these patients, some of which was um, somewhat risk aversion, but some of this was the nature of the population. They didn't necessarily stay for treatment. Um, they were lost to follow-up. They've had a hard time in, in coming back to, uh, to the medical system. And, and so they missed their opportunities for surgery. But I think because of the systems we've set up, we've been much more successful in getting them through. We're still looking at 14, 15% of patients getting surgery where probably 30% of them have a good indication uh, to proceed with. Um, there are still a lot of challenges uh, because of the nature of our population. Uh, there is a propensity to have incomplete antibiotic uh, treatment, uh, either leaving the hospital AMA uh, for various reasons, not having access to care once they leave, uh, not having a uh, you know, stable home situation. In fact, many of these patients are homeless. Uh, and getting patients to follow up once they leave becomes difficult, not only because of the social situation which they go to, but the inability to reach them. Uh, you know, I, I'm, in, I'm intrigued by uh, the systems that, um, that Robin just described, giving patients cell phones and, and other issues. And we have some of that, but I don't think we've routinely uh, implemented that into this population, but it is challenging to reach them and get them back involved in the care. Retention within uh, you know, the, the medications for opioid use disorder has been challenging as it is everywhere. I think we have a pretty robust system at BMC to help with that, uh, that aspect of it. 
And, and I think one of the biggest things we've run into is that we are the largest safety net hospital in, in New England, and we are strapped by finances often. And so the, while the institution supports the idea of the team, there's not been robust financial or ancillary support for the team. And, and much of what we've done has really been on, on a volunteer basis from you know, a group of clinicians who are just dedicated to this particular issue. But I think we have now started to receive some degree of, um, of support and, and hopefully we'll be able to maintain um, a, a core group of physicians going forward. Um, the next steps that we are considering or are looking into, there's a continued evolution of the surgical process. Having spent the last 30 years at this institution, I think we have a much lower threshold now to operate uh, during the acute infection than we did previously. I think previously we had a sense that you had to treat the patients with antibiotics and then go to surgery. Now I think we're operating much earlier. There's much greater willingness to consider repeat operations, especially taking into context why the patient had recurrent infections. Um, we are establishing a multidisciplinary clinic where patients can just come in and be seen by multiple uh, physicians in the outpatient side post uh, their, their infection uh, so that they don't have to keep coming into multiple appointments but really have one multidisciplinary appointment. We have now hired an endocarditis care coordinator whose job is to reach out to bring these patients back into care and help facilitate and navigate their care. And we've had developing partnerships with various skilled facilities to try to ensure that patients can get adequate antibiotics. And we are continuing to expand our formal database and hoping to look further into what our real outcomes are in this relatively complex group of patients with a high um, risk of, of recurrence, uh, recurrent infections, and in a, in a high propensity of, of intravenous drug use. So the take-home points, I, I think, are, are similar to, to what Sim had mentioned, is, is these are complex patients. They require a complex approach, not only medically, surgically, but also socially. And the only way to approach that is with, with a team that has aspects of all of those, um, those issues uh, and, and speci specialists in, in, um, in, in various areas who can communicate with each other and really come to a consensus uh, agreement of what is really the best management. Uh, it does require a time, people who are willing to commit it, and an institutional support of, of the process. And I, I think I'll type there, yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to um, make sure that we have time for, for Dr. Weimer to, to speak as well and to, to get to any questions that uh, the group has. There's a lot of really good discussion that's happening sort of in the chat boxes there, which is great. Hey, everybody. I'll go pretty fast because we have limited time. Um, and I think most, most of the important points have already been stated, um, but I'll share with you our approach at um, Yale New Haven Hospital. Um, so I started getting involved in this work at about 2015, and we wrote this paper um, with Dr. David Serrato, who's now at the University of um, Miami, uh, doing ID work and a lot of addiction work, and basically recognizing that, you know, if we're treating this complex illness, but we're not treating the addiction, we're not really, you know, treating the underlying um, disease. And so many of these uh, cases that we had early on, um, as was previously described, where we didn't address the addiction. Maybe we had a cardiologist, infectious disease, cardiac surgeon involved, but we didn't have addiction treatment involved. Our patients actually didn't do well for many of the reasons that were already discussed. So um, really integrating addiction medicine into these multidisciplinary teams, I think is, is just absolutely um, essential for patients who have injection drug use related infective endocarditis. Um, so at Yale, we have these comeback stories and they're always about, you know, so-and-so had a great knee surgery and they came back stronger. Well, what we wanna do is we wanna have our patients who are treated for their opioid use disorder and their infective endocarditis coming back faster and stronger. Um, so I think some of this is also about the entire health system rallying around patients who have substance use disorder and believing that they can get better and do better and reducing as a health system the stigma that we are all responsible for perpetuating. So if we can kind of create these messages of hope that these patients, as has been discussed, can get better and do well, um, I think you know our patients feel that. So um, we wrote about this, we wrote about our multidisciplinary team needing to include addiction medicine in the Journal of Addiction Medicine last year. This is our uh, multidisciplinary team, many of our initial members here from infectious disease, cardiology, addiction medicine, cardiac surgery. 
Um, and so our team, like many of the teams that have already been discussed, we are really looking for patients who have injection drug use related um, infections. Unlike, I guess, BMC's experience, we, we didn't have as low rates of, of surgery being offered, um, but we did have a lot of angst among our surgeons. And so our team initially started out really focused on those patients who were in critical need of needing, of needing to have an operation. So we initially focused on those who needed a valve operation. We've since expanded to those who have just medical management needs as well. But we really want to make sure that our cardiac surgeons are in these important conversations because they're the ones making that many times feeling like that life or death decision of whether they're going to operate in these many times life and death situations. And they need the support. And so if we've got this team, then they can help make you know, a more informed based on the medicine surgical needs decision as opposed to well, I'm afraid to do this surgery because my patient doesn't have housing or their addiction is not being treated or what have you. So our aim is really to initiate this team to ensure that the patients are getting appropriate assessment and treatment for their underlying substance use disorder and medical conditions. Um, and we really work to optimize their medical care, addiction care, reduce drug use recurrence, and then really also improving their experience in the hospital so they don't feel like the hospital is such a scary place. And also so the care team feels like they are doing the best job for the patient. So this is our team, um, cardiothoracic surgery, addiction medicine, infectious disease, hospital medicine. Many times patients get admitted to hospital medicine and then switch to cardiac surgery, cardiology. Nursing, case management, and social work are also essential um, people involved. We get our case managers involved from day one. If this is a person we anticipate is gonna be in the hospital for 30 plus days, like we need to make sure we're working on those disposition issues pretty early. We meet via Zoom. Um, we don't meet every single week, but we meet most weeks. Um, we you know, don't meet if we don't have patients to discuss, but um, usually I'd say we're meeting at least two times a month, sometimes one time a month. Um, and we're, we are very, very focused. It's a 30 minute meeting. It's very early in the morning. We took a long time to figure out when the meeting was gonna occur. And so because we have surgeons, they're like, if the meeting doesn't occur before eight o'clock, it's not happening. So it's, it's an early meeting and that works for everybody. Um, here we discuss, I'm not going to go through it, but you're welcome to read the paper in Journal of Addiction Medicine. We talk about our kind of philosophy of treatment. You know, we all have to agree to respect each other's opinions. We all have to agree and acknowledge that addiction is a chronic medical disease. These are formative type of philosophical things that our team had to agree to. And we did that as a team, as a, somewhat of a charter. Um, and it comes through. If somebody doesn't have that same philosophy of treatment, it's pretty clear to the rest of the team members that there's a conflict. And so then we also wanted to define, like, what is everybody's role within the team? So we've listed some of that here um, that I would welcome you to look through at a different time. We have some early outcomes data, which I am currently still in the process of trying to um, analyze. We have this data for 26 patients. Our current number of patients we've treated since late 2018 is now 88, and most of those did have surgery. Um, but of the 26 patients that we treated from October 2018 to April 2020, 26 patients, zero of those patients left the hospital um, prematurely. All of them completed their antibiotics, some in the hospital, some out of the hospital. Average length of stay was long, you know, almost 34 days. Medication treatment was started for all of them. All of these patients had opioid use disorder. We looked at engagement in treatment at 180 days post hospitalization, and 62% of them were still engaged in treatment. And we only had one death, um, and that actually occurred while that patient was hospitalized. Some care innovations that we're currently working on. Um, we're working on a patient-informed harm reduction education. So we've talked to patients and said, what are the key things you wish you knew so you didn't get infective endocarditis? And so we're working on that currently. That's going to be for patients and the care team. 
We're working on some um, innovative computer-based treatments we can deliver to the patient while they're in the hospital. So they're actually getting really good addiction care that's evidence-based and computer-based while they're sitting in the hospital bed for those 34 days. We're thinking about how we can facilitate long-acting antibiotic regimens or give oral regimens if people don't wanna stay in the hospital or they can't access SNF. We're um, looking at the use of injectable buprenorphine formulations for those patients who are interested. And I think this piece of ongoing care is really, really essential. And we're trying to find funding. We have no funding other than for our consult service. So everything we do for this team is actually not funded by anyone, unfortunately. So I, you know, these are some of the real um, challenges we have trying to do this work. So I will stop talking and happy to um, take any questions with others. Amazing, thanks so much. We have about five or so minutes for um, questions and just uh, looking through the chat, Dr. Connors is saying impressive meat results. Uh, what types of patients were these uh, with regards to their pre-hospital social medical situations? So these patients, 50% um, of them were unhoused. Um, many of them were not currently engaged in addiction treatment. So similarly, you know, high structural and social determinants of health needs. Okay, several other questions in the chat had been answered too, um, about like how involved the second heart team in Hamilton is when the patients are admitted. Um, does anybody else have any other questions or sort of want to speak any further to that? Tommy from the airport says, how are patients referred to all the teams? Do you think you're missing many or most eligible patients? Well, at, at, at BMC, we don't have a fixed team that rounds on seeing all the endocarditis patients. It's, uh, they're seen individually by the various consult services, but the consult services mainly for cardiology, cardiac surgery, and ID, as well as addiction services. If they identify a patient with endocarditis, uh, those patients are, are routed back to one of our uh, nurses, nurse practitioners who work with cardiac surgery who maintains a database of these patients. We also have an endocarditis order set, which I'm sure others do, it was an EPIC that uh, is a searchable uh, way to identify patients in the hospital with endocarditis, and, and those patients can be identified. But ideally, every patient who presents with endocarditis should be having consults mandatory from cardiac, cardiac surgery, uh, ID, and potentially the addiction services, depending on whether that's their issue. Yeah, I would say we, we probably are sometimes missing um, patients, but by and large, you know, infectious disease, cardiac surgery, cardiology all know that we exist and they appreciate the resource. So there are times that we'll see somebody after surgery, but you can bet once they're in, you know, the CTICU and they're post-surgery and they have an, you know, an opioid use disorder and they're having pain, we're going to get called. Um, so usually we, we get called one way or another. Um, but I think, you know, you do have to, it's part of the sort of culture of the health system. You have to make sure that everybody's aware of the, of the resource. And obviously that changes every year with new health staff and things like that. So I saw there was a question in the chat about, um, pick lines, which I think is one that comes up quite a bit. And, um, this is a question that mostly gets asked of our, um, inpatient addiction team. So we're usually the ones who are answering that question for the most part. Um, and I will say, so our approach is basically um, to consent and educate, um, but offer a standard of care. So uh, if standard of care is the pick line, um, then we basically say, you know, uh, there's this certainly doesn't disqualify from anyone getting a pick line. We have conversations with um, all of our patients about the risks of a pick line, which we should have with every patient, right? The risks of having a, a pick line in, um, you know, what the risk would be if that pick line was used for injection um, and how to, if they are going to use the pick line, how to safely inject. So we generally encourage, you know, if there's another, another peripheral site that you could use for injection instead, please use another peripheral site. And we do safe injection practice education. But if they're going to use the pick line, 
then we talk about what that would look like to use safely. Um, and we do also have conversations with people about whether or not they, they feel comfortable with having a PICC line and going out into the community or whether or not they prefer to stay in hospital for their treatment. Um, for example, some, some patients really don't feel comfortable going into the community because they don't have stable housing. Um, so they're concerned quite reasonably about managing their PICC line safely from that perspective. Um, in which case, if it's easier for them to stay in hospital, we'll, um, we'll advocate for them to stay in hospital for the duration of antibiotics. Thanks. And we're, um, we're just about out of time. There's probably time for this one last question. Uh, Sean says, having previously worked at hospitals where these surgeries don't happen and there's tons of stigma, how do you get buy-in for these teams throughout services in the hospital? Well, I would just say that, you know, the my experience was that the ID doctors and the addiction doctors have been kind of yell, feel like they're like yelling into a void for a long time around this. Um, and so having Dr. Autry, who is a kind of senior respected cardiologist in the community, uh, you know, having him as an ally, being able to get buy in, uh, you know, speaks to the surgeons in a way that's a little bit different and commands different kind of respect uh, around surgical decision making and surgical anatomy. Than, uh, than ID, ID and addiction doctors uh, have. So in terms of like clinical, uh, clinical buy-in, um, that I think having respected leaders from multiple disciplines uh, is, is really key. Um, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a process uh, and, and takes ongoing effort, but um, add that. Yeah, I think that the, you know, the multidisciplinary approach is, is really, it brings in a lot of specialties who are involved in, in and unifies sort of the approach to how to manage these patients. The other issue is, is these patients are on all of our teams. They're on the surgical teams, they're on the cardiology teams, they're on the medicine teams, and everybody has an interest in trying to optimize the care of these patients. And so I, th I think the buy-in was relatively straightforward at our institution because people are looking for some way to better manage these patients. Uh, I, I don't think there's, there's always stigma. I know there is, but I think because it's, at least at our institution is what we have done for a long period of time in the nature of our population, there, there's a commitment to try and improve the quality of their care. And so the buy-in really was not a big issue. I think the, the, the issue, support. yeah, the financial support or the, the administrative support, that's where, where the difficulty comes. I was just going to jump in to say, I think one thing that we found very helpful, um, not just around endocarditis, but I think about um, caring for, for people who use drugs in hospital in general, is really being intentional about feeding back the positive outcomes. Because a lot of hospital-based practitioners only see people when they come back sick. They don't tend to know what happens to the people who do well and stay in the community healthy. Um, so what we've tried to do, because we're a mix of inpatient and outpatient providers, is when we know of someone who's, for example, had a surgery done really well, you know, not interacting with the health system at all because they're just doing great. Um, we make a, a point of saying like, hey, do you remember that person you operated on six months ago? Well, they just got housed. They just got this new job. They're doing amazing. Like, thank you so much for doing that. You know, um, same thing with people in um, the Emerge who start, you know, buprenorphine in the Emerge, which we were promoting is to say like, hey, you know how you started that person on Suboxone? Now, four months later, they're still on it and they're super, super stable. And making people feel that rewarding part of the work that people do get better and that your intervention does have an impact because otherwise we're sort of skewed to only seeing the people who are recurrently becoming ill. Um, and you can get that sense of hopelessness. And I think giving them a balanced view helps. I agree with that. I would just add one, one more point too. If, if say you're having trouble getting buy-in from your cardiac surgeons at your institution, consider cardiac surgeons at other institutions who are doing the work and consider asking them to speak with your cardiac surgeons and these different meetings and places where they can talk and say, hey, this is actually working really well at our institution and have that you know, professional relationship. I know that that has helped. Um, we are very lucky that the head of our cardiac surgery was a champion of this work. So he basically told all the other surgeons they had to get on board and they did. Um, but I know that he also has worked with surgeons across the country to say, you know, you should provide surgery to patients when there is a surgical indication for treatment. So I think, you know, having that important allyship is, um, goes really far. 
Amazing. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for the excellent discussion and presentations. Um, as a reminder, as Tommy's noted, um, all of these sessions are being recorded and they're posted on our, our YouTube page, which he's linked in the chat there. Um, and our final session is on June 28th, and we'll be chatting a little bit about antibiotic regimens, as well as pick lines in people who inject drugs. So we would love to see you all there. And thank you again to uh, Drs. Lennox, Weimer, Autry, and Kimmel for their, uh, their presentations.